losing a partner sucks. Whether you lose them from a divorce or from death, or maybe they're still around, but they're sick. And so they're not your full partner anymore. In fact, you're taking care of them. You become a caregiver and they become the patient or the child again. And so there you are sort of not having lost your partner, but having lost your partner. And what happens to you? Well, it feels really horrible, doesn't it? And maybe you try and handle it by getting super busy. Lord knows there are enough responsibilities to keep you busy, however you've lost them. And if you're taking care of somebody, there's a lot of business, busyness. By the way, what I'm going to be talking about is mostly finding love again, which may not be appropriate for people who are dealing with somebody who's ill. And yet, some of the things I have to say to you, say today, are going to be relevant to you. So hang in there. So responsibilities keep you busy, but there's also loneliness whether they are still alive or not. There is that loneliness of losing the connection to your fair partner. Your equal is gone. And so you feel lonely. And sometimes you stay busy all week long so you don't have to feel that loneliness. And then the weekend comes and then what do you do? Do you stay busy or do you just sort of crawl your way Scrabble your way through the weekend, hoping that it'll be over. Or maybe you anesthetize yourself either through TV or uh, maybe even more serious approaches like drinking or, um, of course, my favorite is book reading. And then there is the anger and the regret. Now, sometimes it's hard to admit that you're angry when somebody in your life, your partner dies. But the mind does go there, doesn't it? That anger that why didn't they see it sooner? Why didn't they do something? And goodness knows men have a real bad habit of ignoring the signs and not taking steps. And so you could have some anger about that or maybe they were stupid and they went out and, and drove too fast or shouldn't have drove or drank or whatever. And there's anger. I had a client whose partner went out bike riding and she begged him not to go out. He had a heart issue and he died on that, that bike ride. And then in addition to uh, the responsibilities, all the extra load because they're not there anymore, or, you know, now you're having to take care of paying for your house with one income instead of two, and there's endless things that you have to get rid of, and the anger and the emotions that keep on coming up that don't seem fair or reasonable, and then the loneliness, and then sometimes your community abandons you, which is really annoying, especially if you've been in a marriage, suddenly your married friends, you know, divorce, death, it's scary. And so they kind of pull back. Plus you're single now, you're a widow. And how do you fit in? You're kind of like a fifth wheel. So you start to begin to feel like maybe you are not loved, that you are not important, that nobody cares about you. And that's not a good place to be looking for a love partner. So here are the, the um, here's two things that you need to know. One is biology and the other is biography. When you lose somebody, it has an impact on your biology. This is not optional. This is real because, oh, hi there, welcome. When we lose somebody, it, we have a physiological response because we are social creatures. We are actually wired to bond. And so when we lose a significant bond, it has a huge impact on our well-being, chemically, mentally, emotionally. 
we feel abandoned, we feel cut off, we lose the, the feel good oxytocin that we were getting in our relationship. And we, um, not to mention that the physiological response to a partner loss is very similar, uh, similar chemistry to a survival response. The survival response of fight, flee, freeze that there, those emotions and that those tendencies actually come up. And how do they come up? So you can get into arguments with people if you haven't dealt with the underlying fears. You can run away. So that's where you might do that anesthetizing or maybe you uh, actually literally get on a plane and go somewhere else or you check out, or you watch TV, and then those are all kind of fleeing or freezing, is you just, you don't want to deal with anything. You just sort of avoid everything. Sometimes that avoidance takes, um, shows up. Well, I'm going to talk about um, two ways they show up, but before I do that, let's talk about the biography. So the choice that you make when it comes to dealing with your loss has a lot to do with your early childhood training. How did your parents respond when there was a loss in the family? What did they teach you? Did they teach you to tamp down your emotions, for example? Or did they create a huge, big commotion over it? Or did they teach you to replace? You know, you lost a friend and they gave you uh, uh, food or they took you on a trip or they bought you a new toy. So these patterns, these are the things that really get in the way of you finding a new love. So let me dive a little bit deeper into that. Repression. When you repress your emotions and you try to go ahead and get involved, you, you know, you wait, you wait the appropriate time, you wait a year and you're like, okay, it's a year, it should be over now. And it's not over. In fact, it actually seems more real than it ever was before. But you feel like that's enough time, you've given it enough time, it's time to move on. If you don't deal with your feelings, they are going to show up. They are going to jump out. And you get into a new relationship and it's too soon. And maybe if the relationship is with somebody who doesn't understand loss, you feel like you need to hide your feelings. But you cannot tamp them down. It takes a lot of emotional energy, a lot of muscular energy to hold those feelings in. And eventually they are going to break free. And you're going to sabotage the relationship because you weren't honest with yourself in the first place. So that's repression. Then the second one is replacement. A habit of that we sometimes are taught as a children, as children, that when we feel bad, when we lose something, the solution is to replace that. So we get a new boyfriend or we get a new partner or we replace it with some other activity. We replace that person with some other act activity so that we don't have to look at it. So for example, me, I re when my husband left me, divorce, I got involved in a spiritual community where relationships didn't matter. That became my life. That became where I put my purpose and where my focus. And it was, in a sense, a replacement. I did not deal with the underlying feelings because when you're in a spiritual community, you can kind of go into that spiritual bypass. Repression, I had a client come to me who had been um, not dealing with her emotions for 20 years. She had lost her husband 20 years before, and she was still actively grieving. Only she didn't realize that she was repressing her feelings because they kept on bubbling up. 
And so, of course, she wasn't able to get into a new love relationship. Every time she saw her son, she would burst out crying. What she needed to do was to release the emotions. Replacement, I had another client who did not grieve the loss of her husband, and she got involved in a new relationship. And he wanted her all to himself, made her cut off her relationship with her children, and then it didn't work out. Because you cannot replace without grieving the first person. I have a, another client who, uh, she was the one who instigated the, uh, the divorce in the relationship. It was only five years. And she went through relationship after relationship after relationship because she did not deal with the grief. She did not release and allow her emotions. And so she was always seeking the dream. She, because what she really lost was the dream. When we, when we lose somebody, we not only lose the physical person, but we actually lose the dream of what we wanted in a relationship. And by the way, that's what we want in our new relationship. We're hoping, we're planning that by learning from our past relationship, we can actually do a better job next time. This is certainly true with divorce, but it can also be true with loss through death, that you actually can love again. You have to do the work. So there's a final one, and that is resisting change. And this comes in two flavors. One is what I call enshrinement. This is where you enshrine the person that you lost and make them the be all and end all that can never be replaced. And, and then this protects you from ever putting yourself out again. And you set yourself up to feel, um, to feel righteous because you are honoring the memory of the person that you lost. But meanwhile, you're not getting the love that you need. And you do need love to move beyond the loss. I was working in a hospice support group and I just had started the group. The, the group had been going on, but I replaced the, the former counselor. And there were several women who had totally embodied widowhood and the sadness of widowhood. And they really enjoyed the perks of widowhood, which was that people would treat them special. I remember another client later on said, it's hard to give up the widow, widower identity because you do get special appreciation for that. However, it really stands in the way of you stepping into a new relationship. This is what sabotages you. And then there is a third, uh, there's a second flavor of this resistance, and that's game playing. You pretend that you want love again. And you do all the different therapies. You go to see a therapist and you do special programs and, and you join uh, coaching programs that are supposed to interrupt, introduce you to new people, and none of them work. And none of them work. And you do more and none of them work. And this is a very, very effective way of preventing you from ever having to go out and play, uh, invite love back into your life, is you play the game of it's never good enough. And you play the game with the person that you try to get involved with also never good enough. Oh, something's wrong. I need to go get more therapy. It's never good enough. If you are committed, if you want love back in your life, if you want to feel that intimacy to be appreciated, cherished, to have a partnership where you work together for a bigger goal, 
for a bigger life? If that's what you want, if you want satisfying sex, you need to change. You need to, you need to handle these things. I like to think that, that when loss happens, the universe is tapping you on the shoulder, telling you it is time for you to change. That things were really not going that well after all. So I had a client whose husband left her after 30 years. And at first she was devastated. At first she blamed it on herself. Then she blamed it on him. And then finally over time she realized that the relationship had not been working for a very, very long time. But we sometimes ignore that, especially after the loss, because we want to go back to where, the way it was before. Change is scary. Change takes work. Change takes awareness. Change takes going back into the shadow and cleaning up the debris. If you are ready and would like to work on your past patterns, and a lot of this stuff, these patterns are not just habits that our parents have taught us, but deeply entrenched habits that come from survival mechanisms of how you need to be in order to survive. And they, they pop up when you lose a partner because that survival mechanism has been triggered. If you want help, the third thing you need, third thing, I told you biology, biography, community. We are social beings. It is very hard to change without the support of your community. Community helps you, supports you in taking risks and guiding you. And that's what the purpose of a coach is, is to guide you. Because it's very hard to solve a problem from the place where you are right now. Because your inner child is telling you what to do. And your fears are telling you what to do. Because your body is in that survival mode. So it's in that place of fear already. So you might be wondering, all right, I need to get some help. You can have an introductory 15 minute for phone call with me. And uh, the link is over in the comments section to find out how I work. You can also check out my website to find out more about how I work and see if we're a match. Have a conversation with me. See what actions you can begin to take to turn your life around. In the beginning, I said, well, some of this stuff could also work for people who are dealing with an alive spouse or partner who is no longer a full-fledged partner. Maybe they have dementia, maybe they have brain damage, maybe they have cancer. Any of these things, they are no longer a full-fledged partner and you are a support person. You are the caregiver, which is a very different relationship. You want to deal with the biography and the biology, and you also need community to guide you through that because the resentment and the anger is going to show up and the remorse because then you'll, you might feel bad about how you're not good enough. And there is loneliness in having to take care of somebody by yourself. Well, I have a whole bunch of information for people who are dealing with caregiving, but it, just like law, any loss, can be an amazing opportunity for cleaning out the old patterns from your childhood so that you can step more fully into your love and life now. And yes, if you're your partner is still cognizant, there still can be love. There still can be rewards. You just have to get the help.
that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. And be brilliant. Bye for now.